I'm just, uh, this is DigitalOcean. This is one of the cloud environments that we use. The uh, reason I'm showing this to you is hopefully you guys also learn a little bit of the cloud. Uh, wherever you want to go in your career, if you don't know cloud, I can assure you in two, three years, you will not have a job unless you know cloud, right? Um, so at least the fundamentals of the cloud. Um, and, and we have DigitalOcean available to MemSQL team. Um, I myself run a MemSQL cluster on DigitalOcean. Uh, so if I go to my, this is my personal project. Um, and uh, this is my MemSQL cluster here. Um, so I have a sandbox created here uh, for some interviews that we do. I'm going to use one of these droplets uh, for this call. That's why I'm showing it to you. And if you're in DigitalOcean, you can always click on create, <coughs> and you can create droplets or Kubernetes clusters, um, um, obviously databases, but their database uh, is Postgre and Mem uh, MySQL, which we don't care about. Um, but there's a lot of things here from load balancers uh, to firewalls, DNS, um, droplets. So if you, if you really want to simulate a client, um, you can do that uh, on DigitalOcean. Um, so um, let me see if I have a droplet here that's using uh, Red Hat Linux or CentOS instead of, um, um, maybe it's this MemSQL itself, um, because I would like to, yeah, this is using CentOS. So let me log into this one. Um, and then we'll take it from here. So if I go um, in TechMonks, whenever we create a droplet, we put the password in the tags. So I know how to log into it later. Uh, so the cloud team, if you don't do this, will come after you at some point or the other because they go through an audit every month to figure out which droplets uh, should be deleted so our bills stay, don't get too high. Um, and that this is one of the ways we track it. So this one's telling me I can log into this with TechMonks uh, as my user ID and the password is DLT for TechMonks. So I'm just gonna use that. Um, and I'm gonna use uh, this IPv4, which is 198. This is my public IP. This one is turned on right now. So if I want to log in, first thing is terminal is your friend. If you, if you are working on Linux, um, you know, at least from a client environment perspective, this is the only thing you'll be using is terminal. Um, I am on Mac, so I'm going to use this. On Windows, you will be using Putty, P-U-T-T-Y. Both of them, at the end of the day, will give you uh, the same experience, so I'm just going to use Mac. Second thing is we use SSH. Uh, if you use Putty, that's the protocol you have to use uh, always to connect to Linux. So I will say SSH, and I think the account is TechMonks. I'll say TechMonks. This is the user ID at the IP address, which I copied. So this is the SSH command. Uh, if you are on a Linux terminal and you want to log into another Linux box, uh, or if you are on a Unix-like operating system, which Mac is, then you can use this command. On Windows, uh, Putty would have a user interface where it gives you a place to put in the ID and the host name or the, or the host IP. So this, this is essentially saying I want to log into this box with this user ID. Uh, I press uh, Enter, it will ask me about the host key. Um, which is essentially used uh, very, um, I mean, it's a very old idea. It says if, if, if I'm logging into the right box or if some other box simulating me or whatever, but it's not really useful most of the times. Um, so anyway, it's going to ask me for the password. I know the password because I just looked it up from the cloud, so I'm going to log in. Um, so now we are logged in um, to a Linux box. To clear the screen, the command is clear. I use this a lot because I like to keep my screen clear. Um, one of the first things um, you guys may want to do is look at, um, you know, files, etc. especially if you're looking at MemSQL. Uh, so, for example, you know, um, there is this history command because I was using MemSQL, so this contains my command history. Um, when you do ls, uh, ls is the command. It stands for listing. Uh, so it gives me the directory listing. Uh, shows a few important things. Um, right away. Uh, number one is on Linux, every file is owned by a user and a group. So this way you're seeing TechMonks, TechMonks essentially means um, the user is TechMonks um, and the group is also TechMonks. Um, this can be different. Uh, by default, every time we create a home account in, in Linux, um, it creates a group, um, at least the CentOS and Ubuntu does the same thing. Uh, with the same uh, the same user ID, it creates a group as well. And all the files by default would be owned by that user and his group. Um, second thing you want to pay uh, a lot of attention to is this thing. This is called the permissions. 
Um, so what does it mean is D means it's a directory, right? So this, this one is a directory. Um, this one is also a directory. So dot means current directory, dot dot means my parent directory. Um, then there will be three fields, um, three fields, uh, three fields uh, like that, sorry, four fields. So that would be read, write, execute. That's what this RWX means. And same thing, read, write, execute, read, write, execute. Um, the first one is, so it stands for UGO user group uh, and all others okay um, so when i say read write execute here it means that the user can read and write and execute uh, the files here so this is my current directory i'm the user tech monks um, r means i can read anything in this directory so i can do this directory listing write means i can create files in this directory um, and execute is required to actually change into directories. If your directory does not have an X permission, um, you cannot change into it. Uh, and also if you're going to run any files, they should need to have an execute permission. So this means that the user, in this case TechMonks, can read, write, and execute. Um, or, or let me pick a file like this, let's say, okay? So this one I can read and write, okay, as a user. As my group, I cannot execute this file. So if I try to execute this file, I will see an error. Um, my group, uh, which is TechMonks also, can only read, cannot write. So if I added some other user who's on this operating system um, into my group, that user would then be able to read the file, but he would not be able to write to it or execute it. Um, this is a good way for me to give permissions to people to, you know, read my files, but I don't want to give them permissions to, um, to actually write to it. Right. Um, same thing. This is for all others. Uh, so this says all others can read this file but cannot write or execute uh, this file. Uh, so if I look at um, the permissions, they are also intersection of each other, which means if there is some permission that's not given in my directory, um, usually those users would not be able to do that. So for example, my directory listing is read, write, execute, read, write, execute for me and my group, but not for all others. So if somebody else wanted to see if my directory had this file, they would not be able to see it uh, because I don't have a read permission to it. But if I gave them a path to this file, they would be able to read it because this file contains a read flag for all others, uh, which means they cannot know this file is there, but if I gave them the path, they would be able to read it uh, inside my directory because the file has a, has a read permissions. Uh, but most of the cases you want these things to match. So if you really were expecting people to come inside your directory and read your files, they should have been an R over here as well. I didn't create these files, but that's how they got created. Um, again, this, this is not really the permission we would want to give because usually this last three should be all empty like this. Um, you really don't want to give permissions to everybody else on the system to read, write, or execute any of your files. Um, if you really want them to, to look at it, there should be a good reason for it, um, doing it on the OS itself. Um, any questions so far on permissions? No, this is fine. Okay. Um, so now we can change permissions by doing a chmod. Um, so I can do chmod and I can say, uh, let, let's pick this file, my SQL history. Let's say I want to give uh, read write access to this file to everybody in my group also. So I will say G plus RW, which what that means is my group should be able to read and write to this file. And then you type in the file name. When I do that, if I do a ls minus al again, you see it has a rw for my group now. So what I said was change mod, give my group permission to read and write. So in chmod command, um, you can do ugoa. So that stands for user, group, um, owner, and all others. And then you can say what permissions you want to give them. Uh, so read, write, execute. Uh, the worst one is obviously this, because I'm saying do everything to my files. If I did this, um, then you know my file would essentially become universally readable, writable, and executable uh, by everybody. So you see it becomes a read, write, execute, read, write, execute, read, write, execute. So if I clear my screen and show it again, sorry, um, you will see. And it turns into a different color um, because it, I turned it executable as well. So when, when file is executable on send, Typically, by default, you will see it in this kind of a green kind of a color. It also depends on what 
terminal emulator you're using, but it may or may not show you the colors. Uh, I'm not fully sure. Um, so um, this way we can, uh, you know, um, control the permissions. There is another way to control permissions, which is using a number. Um, so if I did, for example, 644, and I said this, um, and I did a ls minus al, you'll see it becomes read, write, read, read. 644, the way it works is that um, 4 is here, 2 is here, and 1 is here. What that means is for the first uh, group of these permissions, I'm saying make it 6, which is basically 4 plus 2. So it becomes read, write. Um, if I wanted to make it executable, I would have to add 1 to it because this is 1. So 1, 2, and 4. Uh, so if I made it 744, for example, it would become read, write, execute, uh, read, and read. Um, so this is a short form of uh, using what I was showing before, which is this one. I prefer this one because it's, it's very clear what I'm trying to do. Um, unless you become really good at this stuff and you start using numbers all the time, um, I, would, I would suggest you use the long form because it makes it extremely clear uh, what permissions you are setting on your file. Um, when it will become useful to you is when you log into a database box um, and um, you want to type a log file or something and you don't have permissions to do that. Uh, and if you have pseudo permissions, theoretically you could change permissions uh, and, or, or look at what's going on. Similarly, um, let's say I set my database to write to a certain directory and the user ID of the database does not have the permissions to write to that um, directory. Um, then your database will not be able to work and you'll see errors. Uh, I think we saw this somewhere uh, in EOG before where they were setting it to write to a directory and you didn't have permissions to write to it. Um, so if you, if you get a ticket, ticket like that, uh, where the error is I cannot write, uh, they, this could be one of the reasons, not the only reason, but this could be one of the reasons that permissions are wrong. Um, so what I would suggest is, you know, you look into this command called chmod um, to, uh, you know, uh, get more help on it. Now on Linux, anytime you want to look up something, obviously you can Google, uh, but on Linux you also have this command man. Man stands for manual. So if I say man chmod, you will see a complete manual on this command that will tell you everything you need to know on how the command works um, and, um, and what you can do about it. Uh, and, uh, you know, what are the different ways to um, you know, the UGOA stuff that I was telling you, um, you know, it will, it will give you basically everything that I just told you, right? Um, so this is, a, this is a quick way uh, to look up um, information on any command on the box itself um, instead of having to Google it. Sometimes you may not have internet permissions, etc. cetera. Um, you know, you should be able to do a man uh, on that box uh, on any command. Uh, so for example, I use the ls command. If I do man ls, you will see all, all the different options that this command supports um, and, um, and, you know, what you can do about it. Um, so that's the, that's the permissions command and that's the looking at directory command. Um, so if you look at it, these are the two, three things we look at. Um, the other thing is the file size, which is here. Uh, this obviously for database matters a lot because we want to say, if somebody asks you what is the file size of this, on the Linux box, is it too big, too small? Then you'll have to uh, have to do this command um, and, and get the size of the file. Um, you can do ls minus a a l, but you know this is in bytes, and I'll have to mentally divide it or whatever to get it into kilobytes, etc. But I can do a ls minus a l h. H stands for human readable. Um, so if I do this, then you say it's, it will put it in a format that it makes more sense. It's 16 kilobytes over here. Um, it would say megabytes for M for megabytes, gigabytes, etc. So you can do a ls minus al or you can do a ls minus alh um, to get it in a more human readable format. Um, so that, this um, is is your is your file size, uh, and this I believe is the date of creation, not modification. I'll have to look that up, uh, but I am no, it it is modification. Sorry, because if I touch this file right now, the date will the date will change. Um, so if I set my touch my SQL history, let's see if it changes. Oh uh, yeah, it changes. So this is the last time this file was modified. So again, this is quite useful for you. Um, as DB guys, you're looking at a log file. Maybe the first thing you should look at is, is the log file I'm looking at the right log file or not? Because if the date on the file is not matching 
today's date, that means the database is not writing to that file. Otherwise, this date would be matching today's date. Um, touch command essentially modifies the date um, or, or touches the file in a way. Um, so we use this command either to create a zero byte file. If you touch a file that does not exist, so for example, if I say touch ERT and I don't have any such file in my directory right now, if I do um, you know ls minus al, um, it will show me that this file now exists and it's zero bytes, right? Um, so touch command will uh, modify a file or um, um, you know uh, create the file as a zero byte file. Uh, the other command is rm. Be very careful with this command; it deletes files and you cannot recover them. There is no recycle bin or a trash box with this command. Okay, um, so if I delete a file using rm command, um, that file is gone. Um, you cannot recover it. Um, rm stands for remove. Um, so um, there is this version of rm, and then there is another version of rm which I really hope you don't learn, which is rf forces to remove the file. rm has some. Um, um, it has some um, uh, safety features built into it. If you're trying to delete a very important file, it might uh, you know it might ask you for uh, reconfirming. Uh, so if you do a minus rf. Um, it will delete it without asking you anything, and that's one of the most uh, dangerous commands on Linux. Um, and I would suggest you don't use it. For example, if I try to delete a directory like this one dot config, um, it says I cannot remove it as a directory. But if I did rm minus rf, it would actually remove it. So you know, um, never never really use that command, especially if you if you're not really good at Linux. Uh, I myself have many times um, deleted. Things that I never wanted to delete because I got into the habit of doing rm minus rf, and, and and that's a very dangerous habit. So just remember, rm is remove, and really you don't need to you don't need to learn the more dangerous versions of this command. Um, on a uh, Linux box, there are a few other things that I uh, that are fundamentally going to help you. One thing is, let's say if you are working on a on a on a problem. And you do a shift change, and you want to know what did the other guys do on this box. Uh, one way is you talk to them, and I would encourage you to do that. Another thing is I can just do a bash history. By, by, by default, Linux will log everything that you guys do. So if I do a, uh, if I do a history, I will, I will get this uh, history. And I can also see the date the commands were issued. Um, so. Um, the reason I'm telling you this is the client can always see what you're doing on the box. Every command that you type on Linux is recorded, um, and and actually I can I can pull in the date also. So you cannot um, you know fool anybody on Linux to say I was working on this box. This is one of my favorite commands because if somebody tells me they were working on this box, I run a history and I see they weren't doing anything. Then I know they weren't working, right? Um, so. Um, this this file dot bash history uh, captures everything. Um, so if I do a cat dot bash history, I will see the same um, the same stuff uh, of uh, you know what commands were being executed, etc. Um, this also gives me completion history. So if I press the up button, you know my history file is read, and the console shows me the old commands. Um, so the reason I said uh, the history command is to, to tell you that you can also come in and. Uh, look at the history and see what what commands was somebody um, you know executing um, before you um, and um, you know how they were executing and things like that. So there's a lot of um, if I do a man history, there is a lot of a um, lot of options. Um, I don't remember the option right now, but it can also tell me uh, what time you issued which command. So I can see if you're working on a ticket. If I really want to see um, you know what work you were doing, um, it would be. I can just look at this file. Uh, similarly, for your command processor, at least for uh, MemSQL and also MySQL, same thing uh, can be done using this file, MySQL history. Uh, this is a hidden file in your directory, and it actually contains all the database commands um, that I have issued uh, for a certain interval. Uh, so again, if you want, if I if I go into a box. And you guys tell me you're working on a ticket, and I want to know what work you're doing. Theoretically, I don't need to ask you. I can just type bash history, and I can type MySQL history. I can figure out who's doing what, and you know what has been done. And and the client can do the same thing. So you know when you are on these shifts, don't think that there is no way for anybody to know what you're doing. Um, very very easily, uh, the client can find out if you did anything or did not do anything. 
Um, and this is this is one of the things that has happened in the past because we had the client come back to us and said somebody issued a command um, that they should not have issued. Um, so everything you do on a Linux box is 100% captured um, and, and most probably is audited. Um, and you really cannot, um, you know, when, when you're in Linux, hide uh, what you're doing. It should not anyway, but but I'm just letting you know. Uh, the OS automatically records uh, records these things. Um, anything starting with a dot uh, is hidden by default. So if I do a ls, it shows me nothing. I have to do ls minus al to see the hidden files. Um, this is a convention on Linux uh, and most Unix operating systems. Anything any uh, anything starting with a dot is hidden, and that's why you may not know that there is a MySQL history or a Bash history file here. Uh, mostly because they are hidden by default uh, and the data is captured um, inside these files. Um, <clears throat> so um, that's, um, that's, that's some, of the, some of the fundamentals of files. To create a directory, it's same as Windows. You do mkdir, name of the directory. Remove a directory, rmdir, name of the directory. Um, if, I, if I create a directory uh, and I copy of, or create a file inside it, let's say, you know, like this, uh, and I, then I do a RMDIR, it will refuse to delete it. It will say because it's not empty. Again, the operating system is telling you you are trying to erase data that you cannot get back uh, because you are trying to delete a directory that's not empty. Uh, normally, what you would then immediately do is go inside that directory and see what's in it, remove it, right? Uh, get out of it, and then do a RMDIR uh, name of the directory. Uh, this way, you can uh, you can get rid of it. Um, to rename a file, the command uh, is mv. Um, so in Windows, I think there is a ren command, but on, on Linux, mv is the command. It will do renaming as well as moving. mv stands for move. Um, so to show you, let's create a file called, um, you know, my file. Um, so we do create this file called my file. I want to rename it. I can say move my file to my renamed well, right. Um, so this this command will then uh, rename the file for you. You can also then uh, move it between the directories using the same command. So if I do ERT, I want to move this file inside that directory. I will say move to inside the ERT directory, um, and um, you know uh, the file will uh, then go inside that directory. Um, so um, that's to rename a file. Um, the other thing that uh, you can do on Linux, um, it, it's on, on Windows also you can do it, but it's not really used as much, is make a link to a file. So for example, um, let's say there is a massive log file uh, sitting in, uh, in one of the big log directories on the box, and I want to bring it into my folder to look at that file. Uh, I can just link it instead of copying over like a you know, 10 gig file or whatever. So let me, let me show you. If I create a directory here called temp, um, that's, let's say, my working directory. And I want to look at um, one of the log files. I don't know if I have the permission to, but let's let's try and see one of them. So, where so slash log says messages contains the OS message. So I want to look at this one. Let me make sure first that I have the permissions. Yeah, so I don't have the permission. Let me, let me see if I have permission for anything here. Um, Okay, so there is this one, dnf.log, that I can read because uh, it has an R flag for me. So let's just say I wanted to I wanted to read this file at my own leisure. So I can do something like ln uh, minus s, um, and this will create a symbolic link. Um, and uh, the symbolic link uh, would essentially be the file that I'm linking. Uh, so let's say this one, and dot to my current directory, okay? Um, so now this file exists in this directory, and it's a symbolic link uh, to the other file. What that really means is if you look at the size of it, it's not taking too much size because it's not a real file. It's it's linked to this this file. So if I want to read it uh, or do some things to it, I don't have to keep on typing this long path. I can just do this uh, more, um, more DNF, uh, and it will show me, you know, what's in the file. By the way, the more command is a useful command. Uh, to have because it lets you, um, you know, look at a file one page at a time, um, so you can go through it uh, quickly enough. Um, so the ln command is uh, is essentially uh, for creating um, symbolic links. The format is ln path to the file that you are trying to symbolically link. In which in this case is this, 
and then path where you want to link it. Uh, so if I want a second copy, let's say, uh, and if I said this, then you know, uh, sorry, and it I, and it has to be minus s because it's a soft link. Hard link is something that you know is um, not what we create most of the times. Um, so now I have the second dot DNF pointing to the exact um, exact same file, um, and um, you know the link has been created. Um, if you ever see or want to see if something is a symbolic link, if you do a ls minus al, it will show you an arrow for symbolic links. It does not show you this arrow for regular files. And then it will show you which file uh, is linked into this directory. Um, so essentially, this 2.dnf uh, and the dnf.log both are showing me 16 bytes in their size um, and uh, are not really real files. These are just pointing to, 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 to this file. If you want to remove a symbolic link, you can just remove it like this. Uh, removing a symbolic link does not delete the original file, it removes your link. Um, so, you know, it's, it's um, safe in that way. Um, so, um, this is how you can, um, you can um, create symbolic links um, on, on Linux. Uh, most of the times you would do this if you, for one reason or the other, wanted the same file and also uh, did, not, uh, did not care about if this file is getting modified, then you have a historical copy or not. So because when I do a symbolic link, I am just pointing to this file. If somebody modifies this file, the same uh, modifications will show up locally for me because I don't really have the file. I just have a link to it. Um, if you really wanted the file and not the link to it, then obviously you'd have to copy it instead of creating a link. Now, which brings me to the copy command, which is CP. Um, so CP. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, yep. Can I have a question here? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so let's say if we delete this uh, dnf.log file and then recreate it after some time. So will my link will be valid or it will be invalidated? This is uh, Gaurav here. Yeah, Gaurav. So your symbolic link, when you delete it, will be a broken link. And if you create it back in, it will actually start linking again. That's why it's a minus S, a soft link, which means that, you know, it will survive those kind of things. So I can do it right now. Um, so just why don't we do it right now, right? So let's do a touch A, okay? Ln minus S, okay? The file that I want to create a link from to the file. So now I got a file here um, called B, which is pointing to A. Let's remove it. Um, and B now shows you in red. And you see A is flashing. It means it's a broken link, right? The operating system is telling me this link is broken. Okay. Let me touch A again. Um, and uh, look at it, everything is restored back, right? So um, this is exactly what will happen. If somebody deletes the file, while the file does not exist, you will see it like this. And uh, if it comes back, then things will go back to normal. Okay, thank, thank you, Rui. Yep. Uh, uh, clean my directory out. Okay, so now copy command is cp, and uh, it's very simple. Copy from and where. So cp, for example, if I want to copy my, my my SQL history to current directory. This is the command. So this is copy from dot dot is always means parent. Uh, so the one directory above this is my home directory. Copy my MySQL history file, bring it here. Now I copied it obviously. So, you know, I didn't create any link. So this is a pure copy of, uh, of, of that file, right? Um, other thing uh, is let's, let's copy that DNF file. Let's uh, bring it here. Um, where log, DNF. But, uh, what was it? DNF dot log. Okay. Um, to dot and, and the operating system will say, "Well, where do you want to copy it to?" So I want to bring it to this this directory. Um, so this is how you copy things. So now I've shown you how to copy, create, touch, delete, and create symbolic links. Um, and these are basic directory operations. I also showed you RMDIR, MKDIR, and I showed you the move command which will move things. Um, so you can uh, basically do all operations at this point compared to files. Now comes file processing. And frankly, how effective you are as a system admin or a database admin depends on two things. Number one is how much of you know which queries to run and which tables in the database contain the information that you're looking for. Number two is do you actually know Linux commands to, to be able to investigate files? Um, and both of these are quite important. If you, if you, let's say, are a DB admin and you know, yeah, okay, I run this SQL query, I can get this information. That's 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 good. 
but uh, a real good sys Linux admin who does not know anything about your database but knows everything about Linux uh, can still find almost all the information you can find just because um, Linux um, is very, very good at uh, searching and, and things like that. So let me just show you. Let's say the file I'm dealing with is dnf.log. dnf is, by the way, the program to install packages on Linux. Um, so if I, if I really just want to see this file one at a time, I'll do this, right? And um, you will always see a timestamp most of the times and, and what is happening. Um, and if you see this timestamp, this is in uh, UTC format because that's where, why, the, why the P and Z are, are coming. And you can Google that, what that means. But for example, if I quickly want to see it, I can say more. More starts from the top. So the, uh, you know, when, when I created this My, MySQL cluster, or sorry, MySQL cluster uh, was, was probably on somewhere around this date, uh, 13th of January. If I press space bar, it will keep on going down, 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 and, and give me more of information. If I press Q, it will quit. Um, so there are a few things we can do. Um, this, is, uh, this is a big file. I can run a command called head dnf.log. This shows me from the top of the file what is happening. I, similarly, there is another command called tail dnf.log. This shows me from the bottom of the file what is happening. And let's say I am looking for information. Obviously, most of the times you're looking at tail, not head, right? Because the log file that is there, the database is adding more and more log entries to it. If I quickly wanted to see, okay, what happened today, and I just took a guess, I'll say tail minus n 100 dnf.log, this will show me the last 100 lines from this file, because minus n 100 means show me last 100 lines from the bottom of this file. So I can quickly see, you know, um, what is happening in this file um, <clears throat> in the last, uh, last day or so, right? Assuming that, you know, I'm guessing whatever I'm looking for is, is, is going to be there in the last 100 or so entries. Typically, my, um, my watermark is 1,000. So I will say, okay, show me the last 1,000 entries. In Linux, the other thing is called piping. We can send the output of one command as an input to another command. So I can say pipe it to more. Remember, I was showing you the more command before. So what more command does is whatever you give it, if you give it name of a file, it will start showing you that page by page. If I send the output of this command to more, more is going to do the same thing. It'll say, okay, you gave me all this data, I'm gonna show you page by page. So if I say tail minus n 100 dnf the log pipe it to more, what that means is I'm going to look at last 1000 entries in this file, one page at a time. And you see at the bottom here, it's saying more. So now it started showing me the last thousand entries and I can quickly press my space bar and see if I see anything here that shows me that there is an error. So I'm seeing debug and I'm seeing info, but I'm not really seeing any error. Um, and I can quickly eye this, like, you know, I can just move my eyes through it um, and I can see, okay, okay, is this good or not? Now, why this is helpful is if you are a DBA and you know which log files you're looking into um, and that log file is one gig in size, what are you gonna do? You cannot do anything with a one gig size file. But if you do the tail command, even if it's one gig or 10 gigs in size, you can see what happened in this file in the last day or couple of days. Now this is one easy way. There is another way uh, or something else uh, that I can do. Uh, I can say this and I can say, well, I'm looking for anything that starts with error, okay? Uh, so grep is the most powerful command you will ever learn in your life. And if you can, if you can master this command, most of the times uh, you're going to be like a ninja in finding issues and fixing issues. Um, I don't care what it is because grep can go through binary files, anything, um, and, and give you what you're looking for. So let's say I, I really wanted to know, is there any error on my box, um, you know, uh, in the last, uh, last day or so? And I assume that I knew that like last thousand entries are probably for the last day. Um, then I say grep error. And, and if I get no output, that means, you know, it didn't find any such thing. Grep also, and you, I mean, I would strongly suggest you go and Google it and learn all the options. If I said grep minus I, that means uh, case, case insensitive, which means if it was error that I'm looking for, or if it was error, it doesn't matter. It, it will be case insensitive. Again, there is no error. Uh, so let me say, okay, well, for, what about info? Is there any info? Um, so you can see, and grep will actually highlight it for you to say, okay, I found these commands and they have, um, they have info. Now you can see info is all capitals, uh, but in my command, because I said minus I info, it showed me anyway. 
But if I take out this, then it's only it's only showing me this other part, not showing me the ones over here with info. Um, that's because it's case sensitive by default. Um, so if I say, you know, uh, I need to find something, most of the times I say minus I because I don't know most of the times what is the case that I'm looking for. Uh, in which case it will it will give me regardless of the you know how the thing is documented in the file it will it will give me that information um, so this if I do this um, then okay so this is this is all the stuff that it's it, it's telling me um, and the other thing I would do in a log file like this let's say I did my minus n one thousand um, but you know I noticed hey this is twenty twenty one o two ten which is February tenth. And it, um, you know, it's it's ending at 02.12. Uh, but I really just want everything for for 12th because I don't care. My issue started from 12th. You can, uh, you know, grep is such a useful command. You can say grep this, grep it again, and you know, grep this. Now you see it filtered it. These entries are only from 12th of February. So you know, um, this is, uh, you know, if I if I didn't know if it's thousand or ten thousand, I can put a big number here. It wouldn't really matter because using grep I can filter. So grep is your command to filter anything that you want to filter. And once you know, uh, and you can filter it even more after that. So you can keep on adding more greps here to to get into the depth of the issue um, that you're looking for. Um, and and grep will keep on filtering that uh, for you. Um, any questions so far? Yeah, here, Rohit. Uh, okay, I think sorry, there was uh, somebody else had a question. Somebody else. I think yes, Shweta was saying something. Yeah. After you, Shweta. Uh, search like after a keyword. I so, want all the logs after a word. Yes. So, grab also supports minus n and minus f. If I said minus n ten, this will actually start showing you all the log entries after that keyword. So minus n10 means next 10 entries after when you find it. And it will it will show you that. And it also supports minus b for before. So let me let me try and do this. Let's let's look at this DNF and let's say I'm looking for something. Um, logging initialize. I want all entries after the logging initialize. All entries after it initialize. Yes. The, so for the last logging initialized. You mean when the file started? After a recent uh, logging initialized. No, I want all the logs after that. So do you know what is the first command, for example, when the logging initializes? Let's 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 pick something like this. Like this is let's say my keyword. Okay. Sub debug, right? Yeah. And let's say I'm looking for Bunch of entries after this because you know after this there is there is an error okay um, and I don't I don't know if my file has this or not so first thing I will do is I will say cat my file and I don't really care about minus n or whatever so dnf dot log pipe it to grab minus i and sub debug so yes I know there there are some issues here so then I'll say okay well this does not give me enough information you know what exactly happened right. I want to know that, um, and let's say I, I, this is the date I'm interested in, not not these other dates. Um, so what I can do is this is the date I'm interested in. Obviously, at some point I will also have to grab this date, right? So if I if I do that, obviously this is going to reduce it even more. It just gives me one. But now I say, okay, fine. The debug event that happened on this date, this is my keyword, this is my date. But what I'm also looking for is, um, and maybe you know minus n. Um, Ten. Um, so give me ten, 10 lines. Let's first look at it, uh, what it gives, and then we'll see if we can filter it down more. So now every time it sees this thing, it's giving me ten extra lines um, after after that. So I can say, okay, when this happened, and what happened after that um, is 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 right here. Um, so this usually will give me uh, what I need to know, um, you know, on that um, on that particular um, keyword. I can also do a minus b, which means before this happened, show me so many lines uh, before it happened. Does that tend to answer your question? Yeah, no. yeah. And then I know what you're asking is if from there I want to see all of the file, 
Um, there are other commands for that, like cut, where I can cut my file. But right now, I'm just saying, if I put, you can put a high enough number for now and quickly get the information. Because what I use grep for is to really just find quickly if there is something. So I can say, give me 1,000, because I don't know how big this file is. But every time it has this keyword, it will, it will, it will start from that keyword. And the next 1,000 lines after that keyword, it will try to print it for me. Um, and then I can, you know, I can try and figure out more from there. Um, <clears throat> so these, um, these are some of the things that we can do. Um, and if I, if, you know, um, not, depending on how I want to define it, um, I can define it more. So, you know, for example, if I want a certain date, um, I can do that uh, and things like that. Um, now there's, there is one more, um, one more very big use of grep beyond this. Because if you look at these commands that I was showing you, I knew which file had the information that I'm looking for, okay? Sometimes I don't even know if the file has the information. Now this is, let's say I want to become root just so that you know, I can type every file I want. Um, so let me become root. And by the way, the sudo command, uh, you know, uh, it's not sudo root, um, sudo bash. Uh, sudo will basically start anything you say as root. And uh, most of the people, and I would say 95% of people fall in this category, they think if they don't give you the root password, but they give you access to the sudo command, uh, you cannot become root. And that's a complete nonsense because any command you run with sudo will be run as root. So if I said sudo bash, I will actually get a root shell. So if you give somebody a sudo access, they are root on your box for all intents and purposes. It's stupid to think if you don't give me your root password, but you made my account able to do sudo, I cannot become root because there is this hidden command, bash starts a new shell. So if I say sudo bash, it says start this new shell as root and I become root. I can in fact change the root password now if I want. If I did this command, I can change my root password. So um, be careful about security on Linux. Anybody who can do sudo, unless you put um, you know, more controls around it on what command they can put sudo on, um, for all intents and purposes, 100% they are root and you get no extra security by uh, not giving them the root password. They can always become a full root on your box. Um, and and, and, if, um, and uh, the reason I'm telling you this is if, if you are in a client box, if you really need to become root, you can, but uh, I would strongly suggest you don't. Uh, in case the client has not given you the root password, you can ask them for permission and say, hey, do I have your permission to become root for next five minutes because I need to fix certain things on this box. If they say yes, then if you have sudo access, then you can always become root. Um, so anyway, I'm root now. So let me go to where slash log. Um, this is an important directory from an operating system perspective. Where slash log contains all the, all the important log files for the operating system. This is good for you to know because um, most of the times um, things that are going wrong would be in some file here. This one is called the systems. Uh, uh, in Windows, if you remember, there is a event log. Uh, this is similar to Windows event log on Linux. Theoretically, it should contain messages from pretty much everything um, on the operating system. Most applications don't follow it, um, but you know, theoretically it should. So different applications, so you see MemSQL actually follows it. So MemSQL is putting its messages into this file. Uh, slash where slash log slash messages um, and they will um, you know um, it, it, it's telling me when it, the memsql service is starting and um, you know what are the different things that uh, that memsql is doing I can see if my memsql service is crashing um, you know um, and then uh, and then all of that stuff so memsql studio access etc so again if I if I wanted to filter this file uh, for memsql I could have done just a grep, um, you know, uh, grep on it. So I would have said cat messages, send it to grep, uh, and I'm looking for anything for memsql, um, you know, and uh, um, and when when what's going on uh, would would show up here. Um, but let's say I didn't know any of this stuff, right? I I just want to know in my entire Linux box is there anything here regarding memsql um, that you know I should know about? There is a command in grep called grep minus r, which means recursive, and dot, which means starting at this directory, um, and what are you looking for? Um, sorry, memsql, and where do I start? This will actually go through every file 
starting from my current directory or whatever path I give to it. And it will search for this word called memsql. And if it finds it, it will print it out. And it will tell you which file that that word is in and what date and things like that. So for example, uh, in my secure log, I have uh, entries for memsql. So I can now know this file has some information about memsql. Um, I should look at this file more. So if you didn't know where is this information, I want to search my entire box, etc. Like is somebody hacking me? Is somebody, so you know, somebody, um, you know, tried to log into my box with a failed password, uh, invalid user PG. So somebody's thinking I got PostgreSQL on this box, right? Um, and they are trying to attack this box. Uh, by doing SSH2. And why are they doing it? Because the port for memsql is open on this box. So obviously I'm going to start seeing all kinds of database attacks. And that's that's what's happening. Uh, basically these are all hackers from Russia trying to attack my box. Um, so um, this is, uh, you know, um, this is just one, uh, one very important command to remember. It's very, very useful if you can master it. If you say grep, minus R will be recursive. Whatever you're looking for, and which path it should start uh, looking into. So if I say dot here, it's going to look into my log directory and every other directory underneath it and every file underneath it and try to find the string memsql. And when it finds it, it will tell me the name of the file and also um, the show me the line where it found the string. Again, those things like minus n and minus b that I was showing you before work. Um, and um, you know, um, I, can, I can use those. For example, if I say, okay, fine, find me memsql and I really want to know if there is anything with error in any of those files. Um, then this will show me, you know, um, anything that has memsql and error in that, um, in that any file um, from this path, right? Um, so obviously I'm looking at the OS right now, but if memsql was exceeding memory, disk space, all of those things will typically get logged in here somewhere. Uh, in my case, it's not doing any of this. The uh, only thing I'm getting is, is essentially attacks, uh, which is fine. Um, you know, it is what it is. Uh, but I can, I can literally go through my entire box um, and I can find, and this is why I was saying, if somebody does not know anything about your database, but he's very good at Linux, that person can probably find more information than you can find because he can use something like this and he can find every error irrespective of the case that's happening on memsql on his box within probably five minutes. Um, and, and you would look really dumb in front of that person if you said, I'm a, I'm a DB expert in memsql, but I cannot tell you what's wrong in, in one hour while well, you can tell me in five minutes. Um, so this, these kind of things are important to learn. Um, just if you go into a box um, and you don't know anything, you can still find uh, everything on a Linux box by using this command. There is no equivalent of this command on Windows. They have a search box, but it's, it's nowhere as powerful as what grep can do. Um, uh, for you, um, and the recursive command uh, is, is 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 quite useful. Um, this is one of the most powerful commands from a debugging perspective um, that you can uh, you can know about. Um, the other thing is operating system errors on a Linux box because I'm running out of time. I only have three four minutes left. Um, if you want to find out if the system is running out of memory, disk, etc., there's lots of ways to do it. But one of the first things you should look at is D message. D message will give you all the important kernel messages. So if something is going on with the box, um, you know, that is, you know, running out of memory or things like that, typically D message will, will show it to you. Uh, and you will see it at the bottom usually. Um, you won't, uh, so there's, there's two things. There is where slash log slash messages, which contains messages really from every application, or it should contain at least. Then D message is for the kernel messages. Um, so if the kernel is running out of memory, et cetera, you know, it will tell you. And most of the things kernel will print here. So for example, it's telling me how much graphics memory I have and, you know, um, how much VRAM I have. So this is another thing. If your box is misbehaving, uh, one good command to remember is D message. Usually this is one of my starting points. If, if, I, if I think that there is something wrong with my box, I will start at D message uh, just to see if the kernel is, is, is telling me that it's, you know, running out of memory or something like that. Um, it will it will show up here. Um, the other commands, uh, and I will show you, is free. A minus H, for example, you can do. So this will tell you your memory. Uh, so I got uh, almost eight gigs of memory on this box. I am using nine sixty six megabytes of memory. I have free five gigs, uh, and then there is you know buffer cache, etc. Um, and I'm not using swap. If you are a database administrator. 
if 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 the operating system is starting using swap, you know, heavily, and especially if it's running out of swap, uh, you know, uh, then you have issues because that means the memory is not enough, and the system has started using the disk space for memory, which is going to be extremely extremely slow, um, especially for MemSQL that will kill your queries. Um, and this is this this is a quick one to see if my box is running out of memory or not. Uh, minus H again human readable format so that it will put it in gigabytes and megabytes instead of putting it in bytes, uh, which I may or may not understand. Um, so this gives you a quick, um, you know, a quick uh, rundown of memory. Uh, if you want to see more information, there is this command uh, called top command. Um, that will show you things like who's using how much CPU uh, as a person. Now remember this thing gives you percentage memory, which is not really that important. Um, I, I prefer the free command to know you know who's using how much memory because as a percentage of memory you know if something is using five percent of eight gigs uh, okay fine but i don't want to take out a calculator to do that again you can see memsql is obviously at top of this um, it tells me you know it's using four percent cpu right now and it's using five percent of my memory memory i'm okay i don't care but the cpu is seems okay i mean there's a there's a master uh, node and then there's a there's a leaf mode because it's a one box cluster on this box my CPU is around 10%. Um, this is okay. It's not. It's not too bad, right? Uh, up here, it gives you um, a full uh, readout of the CPUs. Um, it gives you a full readout of, of your memory as well. Over here, how much is free? How much is used? Uh, most of the people on your team would be using this command quickly to see what's going on, um, and um, you know, um, which process is using how much memory, etc. If, we, for example, my MemSQL was showing me using as 60% CPU, then we know we have an issue because it's using too much, uh, too much CPU. Um, so these commands are two commands uh, you should remember. Top command, T-O-P, um, and uh, the free command, which tells you on, on the memory. Now what remains is disk. We want to know what's going on with our disk. There's a command called DF. DF stands for disk free. And if you do a DF minus H, it will show you what's going on with, with your disks, right? So I can see that I have, um, you know, um, dev slash VDA1, 160 gigabytes, used is seven gigabytes, available is 153 gigabytes. Um, nothing here is showing me anything is bad. Now, you may ask me, okay, this is great, but how the hell do I know? Uh, you know, I'm seeing all these uh, file systems here. These are all file systems, dev tempfs, tempfs, slash dev slash VDA1. And you may want to know, okay, well, is this my database disk or is this my database disk? So there is also a command called mount, and mount will tell you what, what is mounted where, okay? So now again, this is too much information. So really, I want to know uh, what is this thing, right? Um, where is this mounted? So I can use grep, as it is, uh, to see this is, this is, this device is mounted on my root file system. Um, and that's the one, um, you know, my memsql is on because really uh, on this box, I only have a root. Now it, it's also showing me here that it's mounted on root file system, so I didn't have to do that. Um, I think this is uh, the new OSs have it. In, in the old days when I learned Linux, it would not give us the, the mount point. It would just give us the file system. Um, so I guess you don't need to use the mount command. You just you can just look at here and you can see if if wherever your database files are is part of this path, then that's what you need to look at. And if you're running out of space, then you know uh, that's an issue. And you need to talk uh, on the client side for them to increase your database uh, disk space. So uh, the top command, uh, mostly I use it for CPU. The free command tells you what's going on with memory. And the df minus h command will give you all the information about file systems and how much disk uh, is there on the box, how much is free, how much is not free. I'm going to stop here. Um, any questions so far? Uh, yes, Rohit. Uh, uh, just like we uh, we track the processes, can we uh, do the same type of tracking? with One last thing since we talked about threads is Proc slash CPU info will give you a lot of information. This is a proc stands for process file system. It contains the same information that I was showing you through the top etc. command. Uh, Linux will uh, usually uh, put all this information in files also. So over here, if I say proc that's CPU info, things like you know what is my processor, what is my you know um, uh, model of the processor, how many cores I have. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, um, would would show up under under this uh, um, under this file. So in this in this case, I have four processors uh, because you see this is processor number zero, 
processor number one, processor number two, and processor number three. So I have four cores on this box. Um, so you know, if I if I wanted to know how many cores I have, I would do the same thing. I would say processor, um, and then you see I ha I have four cores on this box. Um, there's a lot of information you can get from Proc. Uh, thread for sure is here too. Um, you should read up on what the Proc file system contains because this will give you pretty much anything that's going on on your box without knowing any commands. If you type these files. Uh, you can see everything that's going on in your in your box. You know you can get the memory statistics, memory info. This is raw info, but if you type these files, they will potentially give you more info than the commands themselves can give. Um, and this this gets continuously updated. So this one is, for example, telling me how much free memory I have, how much buffers I have inactive. Um, this is this is deep dive, and this is what really good system admins would know because they would know how many huge pages I have. All of this can impact your database performance. Um, same thing for disk stats. Um, so Manmeet, for example, in his monitoring, he looks at disk stats, and he looks at a bunch of these things, and he can predict if this box um, is going to slow down the database or not because you know he he looks here. Over here, there is one thing for threads as well. I'll just find the path and I'll 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 let you know uh, which one contains all the information for threads. Okay, uh, but you guys can, if you want, you can say you can Google this proc file system. Um, and uh, and you know what all information you can get from this proc file system. K message, for example, is the kernel messages file, which is same as D message. So if you didn't, you know, if you didn't want to remember all the commands, but you knew everything is in proc, theoretically you can get all the information from from here as well. Any other questions? All right, guys, I recorded this call, um, so I'm gonna send the recording out. Uh, afterwards, um, we can do more stuff.